Good evening, everybody. My name is Chris, and I am an alcoholic. And it is an absolute pleasure to be here. I love uh, I love any meeting that Kevin is uh, Kevin Kevin is hosting. It's always going to be a good time. So, uh, so my job here tonight, my job here tonight is to uh, to talk about alcoholism, talk about my alcoholism, see if I can share something with a little bit of depth and weight, and uh, uh, and identify, uh, you know, be able to identify with with some of you. Because if um, if you're alcoholic too, there's going to be some things that uh, you're gonna you're gonna uh, identify with me with. So um, so I believe very very much in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. I've um, you know I've really done uh, a lot of work with that book. Certainly reading it quite a bit, and I know of no other place uh, in any type of literature where the problem of alcohol is alcoholism is better explained than the big buck. And the solution is laid out for, uh, for alcoholism in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, um, when I was out there dying of alcoholism, I really didn't know what was wrong and I really had the problem wrong. So, so I understood that I was, drinking too much upon occasion i would i would become overserved you know and uh, and and become a, a belligerent drunk uh, that that was prone to happen quite often right so uh, so i kind of identified i first first of all i identified all of you as the problem okay you know it's bad breaks it's misunderstandings it's my family it's my boss Oh, you know, she just, she just doesn't, under, she doesn't understand. Yeah. And, and my friends are just not loyal, you know? So for a long, long time, I was, uh, I was pretty convinced uh, that, uh, that I had just been put in a really bad position and I was doing the best I could with a, with a, with a bad position. And, and, and if you had the type of uh, circumstances that, that I was prone to, you probably would drink a little bit too, you know? Uh, well, well, as, as my alcoholism progressed and, and it, it just, you know, over any considerable period of time, alcoholism gets worse. It doesn't get better. And what that looks like, at least what it looked like on me was, over any considerable period of time, more ounces of alcohol were going in my body every day than, you know, the year before, the month before. And if you drink a lot of alcohol like that, whether you're alcoholic or not, you're going to do drunk, drunk stuff. You're going to get in trouble. You're going to pass out a lot. You're going to lose a lot of friends. You're going to disappoint a lot of people. And, and all that was happening. And only really toward the end, you know, I drank for 20 years, only really in the last several years. Did I recognize I was in real trouble with alcohol? And, and when I recognized that was when I tried to stop. I tried to stop drinking. Uh, I, um, I told myself a lie about this stuff. So, so this is basically what it would look like. I would come to in the morning, you know, wearing the clothes I had passed out in the night before. You know, I'd stagger to my feet. It'd be a work day. I'd stagger to my feet, go into the bathroom, you know, throw some water on my face. You know, I was, I smoked non-filter cigarettes then. So I have to do a lot of vomiting calisthenics, you know, and then, you know, I'd brush my teeth and go out to my hundred dollar car and go off to my terrible job. Just swearing to God, I never want to feel like this again. I, I am shattered. Uh, you know, I am ill in. And, and I do not want to ever feel like this again. Today, today, I am going to quit drinking. I am going to quit drinking. Now, here, here's the funny part of all this. If you would have put a lie detector on me and you would have asked me, hey, Chris, are you, are you, are you quitting drinking today? I, I would have said, yes, absolutely. And I'd have meant it with every fiber of my being. The needle on, on the on the lie detector would go to true. And, and uh, it... it because I meant it, right? Well, what would happen is uh, is I'd get about half a sandwich down at lunchtime. I'd rehydrate. Quitting time is 4.30. About 3 o'clock, I'd start to think, you know that decision to never, ever drink again? You know, that's that, that, that might be an overreaction. 
to this whole thing. Yeah, you know, I'm you know, I might have to modify this not ever drinking again thing, right? And by 4 30, I will have I would have modified it to going straight to the liquor store to, to start the whole cycle over again, buy another quart of vodka, buy another quart of bourbon. And I was caught in this. And here's what here's the lie I told myself. And I know I'm not alone in this. The lie I told myself is I changed my mind. I changed my mind and I got drunk. Now, what I know about alcoholism today is that's the big lie. That's the alcoholic's big lie. Because we don't have a mind to change. You know, we don't have a plug for the jug if we're an alcoholic. We are powerless over putting alcohol back in our body. It doesn't matter if we don't want to. It doesn't matter how what the consequences are. It doesn't matter if we're going back to jail. It doesn't, you know, none of, it doesn't matter if she's going to leave. None of that stuff matters. Alcohol goes back in our body if we're alcoholic on our own unaided will. That's what alcoholism is. So, so I only learned that from the book Alcoholics Anonymous. So this whole time, uh, you know, I'm taking credit for being sober and I'm taking credit for getting drunk and I have no credit. <laughs> you, know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? So, so, so what alcoholism is, is it's, an, it's an inability, an inability to bring into the consciousness, the suffering and humiliation of a week or a month ago. Uh, I am without defense against the first drink. And until I realized that, I did not know what I was up against. I thought I just, I, my first exposure to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, you know what I thought? I thought that AA was just like a big pep rally. You know, we would come in and it'd be, yay, yay, we don't drink today, you know? And, and we first things first, and we upside down think, and we keep it simple, you know? And, and we hold hands and say the Lord's Prayer, and, and then we break, you know, like, like a football huddle. And, you know, the next day, uh, we tell you, oh, let's, I'll see you at the Looney Nooney tomorrow. All right, you know? You know, stay enthused about this not drinking stuff. Keep it green, this not thinking, drinking stuff. And that's what I thought Alcoholics Anonymous was until I got drunk, really, really trying to not drink. Right. And, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I came back in with a desperation an absolute desperation uh, to stay sober. And, and, you know, the lucky thing, lucky thing in my case was I was exposed to some people who had a real, real depth of understanding of, of what alcoholism is from the big book, not from some treatment center or some detox, you know, from the book Alcoholics Anonymous, these guys knew what they were talking about. They had deep, deep experience. And, uh, and I started to listen to, I started to listen to, to, it was cassette tapes back then. I started to listen to this stuff and it started to really make sense to me, you know, what they were talking about, uh, about alcoholism. Now, now, um, what uh, what I believe today with alcoholism, what I believe today is um, I have an inability to stay separated from alcohol on my own in an unrecovered state. I have no ability to control it when it goes into my body. And there's a dash and that dash, that dash is related to the unmanageability of my life. And, and for a long time, that confused me. But... There's information in the book Alcoholics Anonymous that talks very, very specifically about unmanageability and 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 what type, what do, you know what do I suffer from with with unmanageability? And there's a great uh, number of pages, I believe it's from page sixty to sixty four, that talks about the depth of uh, of my real problem and why my life why my life is unmanageable. And and in this. Uh, in this material, it talks about selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of my trouble. Now, it, again, the, all of this, I had to come to terms with all of this stuff uh, after I'd been in Alcoholics Anonymous. None, none of this was like flipping a light switch. I mean, I, you know, I had to... I had to become convinced of this stuff through inventory and through good sponsorship and, you know, going to a million meetings. 
I finally, I finally started to believe that this, this was true. Selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of my trouble. Underneath all of the drinking, what I believe alcoholism is, is it's a toxic experience of self-consciousness. I am more self-conscious than the knucklehead next door or the, or the other people in my third grade class or whatever. I, I, am, I am toxically self-conscious. Now, what does that look like? What does that look like? As I'm growing up, I'm, I'm uncomfortable 90% of the time I'm, I'm uncomfortable with myself and I'm uncomfortable with my environment. I've got a ton of self-centered fear and, and I'm sensitive. I'm sensitive to the injustices of the world. Okay. You know, I pick up on those injustices. Maybe most scuttlefish don't, but, but, but I'm burdened with a mind, you know? So, so I pick up on, on, on the injustices of the world and, and I develop resentments and I, and I start to form opinions and prejudices and all this stuff. And all this stuff revolves around this self-consciousness and, 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 and really, really what the, the pain in my soul, and the pain in my spirit is this self-consciousness. And, and what it looks like is uh, I'm burdened with resentments uh, that have to do with the past. Okay, I can't believe that guy did that, you know, and, and you know, yeah, I, I'm, you know, it's what I should have done. What should have done. I mean, the guy did 10 years ago, this guy, you know, so I'm like hanging on to this stuff for decades. This, this unresolved, you know, anger. And, and if you do something or you say something, immediately I am reflecting that on how that affects me. You attacked me. You made me look bad. You made, you're trying to make me look foolish. And, 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 and so, so this, this, this experience of self-consciousness puts me out there in the world and, and I get banged up. You know what I mean? Like, like Forrest Gump doesn't get banged up. He doesn't have that sense of self-consciousness. Yeah. You know, I'm like burdened with this stuff. You know what I mean? And, uh, and, and that has a lot to do with, with resentment and self-centered fear and depression and stuff like that. Okay. Anxiety. If I'm not burdened with that stuff, I have the self-centered fear and the anxiety of the future. I'm always worried about what's going to happen. I suffer from things that aren't happening. That, that comes from like a toxic sense of self-consciousness. And what does that look like? It looks like this. Oh man, I'm gonna go. To, I'm gonna have to go to work tomorrow, you know. And I, I screwed something up, and I know my boss is gonna have words with me. And you know, when the boss has words, I'm gonna have words back. You know, we're getting an argument. I'm gonna have to hit him. And if I hit him, he's gonna fire me. And you know, and if I'm fired, I got no job. Yeah, you know, I won't be able to get unemployment. You know, I'm not, I won't have any money. I won't get. So, so that kind of stuff is going through my head constantly. Now, living with the trauma of that self-consciousness, you know, what, what happened was I learned to pour alcohol on that stuff, to quiet that crap, right? And to have a little bit of anesthesia away from that stuff. And what happened was I became an active alcoholic and I am caught up in this stuff at an incredibly deep level. And if I don't, if I don't engage in a recovery program, I might stay sober. We've all met these guys in the meetings. I'm sober today. You know, I'm sober 15 years. God damn it. You know, we, we, we've met these people, right? It, it's like a tentative, painful sobriety. But what the book Alcoholics Anonymous offers us is, is a state that they describe as happy, joyous, and free. And for me to be free, I need to be free from the resentments 
and I need to be free from the fear and the anxiety and the depression and all the stuff that lives within my spirit and my emotional condition, the things that I believe are the toxic alcoholism. I need to be free of that stuff. And, and it's, it's, it's amazing. I get, I get exposed to this stuff. Now I'm going to meetings. I'm going to meetings like a crazy man when I'm brand new, right? They said, meeting makers make it. <laughs> and I'm making the meetings. Uh, you know, my, my sponsor grabbed me. This is 1989. My sponsor grabbed me. And he said, uh, Chris, I'm going to tell you to do one thing. And that one thing is I want to see you at a meeting every night until I tell you to stop. Uh, well, he moved away before he told me to stop. So, so I, I, I literally went to a meeting every single night for my first eight years. Okay. So I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of sympathy for somebody, you know, who, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of tough for me to get to two meetings a week and I don't have much sympathy for it, but, but, but anyway, I, you know, I was a meeting maker and I was making the meetings now, now before I understood anything about the steps before I understood anything about recovery, I was exposed to the fellowship. And I'm incredibly grateful for that. We were fellowshipping. The fellowship was so much better 30 years ago than it is now, at least in my area. I mean, you know, there were tons of people in their 20s and 30s. You know, I, my home group doesn't have anybody under 50 in it now. You know, but but there were tons of people in their 20s and 30s. We were dating each other. You know, it was great. You, you, you'd, be, you'd be dating a girl and, you know, her sponsor and your sponsor would have to get together to do damage control. It was like crazy. And, and you know, there was, there was sober softball and sober volleyball. And you went out to the diner after the meeting and you went to the slow, painful root canal ass sober dances and it, you know everything you'd help somebody move you know like every week you'd have to be like, you, you help me move you know i'm getting i'm getting thrown out of my place i need somebody to help me move you know you're moving people you don't even know we got really involved in the fellowship and i'm incredibly glad what that did was that that cemented me into this society you know i am i am in this society now for life you are my people i ain't going nowhere and 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 that was that was cemented in in the early days and i'm incredibly grateful for that everything started from that but not drinking and going to meetings is not a solution for alcoholism it is not the treatment for alcoholism <laughs> no matter what you think it's not it creates a tentative sobriety a tentative sobriety and i know how tentative it is because i've seen a lot of people drink you know, I've, I've more people drink who come into AA than don't. So there's got to be something else, because if it says rarely have we seen a person fail who thoroughly follows our path, there's got to be a way to thoroughly follow the path. And, and, and I was exposed to some of these guys early on. My first exposure was to, to a, a Joe and Charlie, a set of Joe and Charlie tapes. And uh, and that made me incredibly mad. That really pissed me off because because I you know a guy uh, insisted that I listen to the whole thing because he thought I would I needed it or whatever, right. And and Joe and Charlie were saying things like this. At least this is what I heard. This wasn't what they said. Yet yeah, it was what I heard. If you aren't working the steps out of the book Alcoholics Anonymous, you do not have an AA program. Because that's what an AA program is, working the steps out of the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. So when you drink, you know, please don't tell anybody that AA didn't work. Because if you're not, if you don't have a recovery program, AA shouldn't work. You should drink. And, and, and so when I'm hearing this stuff, you've got to understand I'm freaking out because, because I'm, go, I'm going to discussion meetings. I'm going to 12 and 12 meetings. I'm going... Uh, up here in the north, we have we have two speakers and a lead for for speaker meetings, and I'm going to all those meetings. So you do 20 minutes, you know, on your on your story or whatever. And I'm going to meetings like crazy. And and if Joe and Charlie are right, everyone in all of my meetings is wrong, including my sponsor. How am I supposed to internalize that? 
So I didn't, <laughs> you know what I mean? I pushed the tapes aside and I said, ah, they're from Arkansas. You know, maybe that's, maybe that's how they can do it in Arkansas. New Jersey, we share, you know, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I pushed it aside, but, but I got hit with life. You know, I got hit, I got hit right in the face with life. Uh, a bunch of things happened and it crippled me emotionally. And, you know, they talk about a jumping off point. They talk about a second surrender. Hell, you can call it a nervous breakdown if you want. But but I, I got put in the barrel in a big way with about nine months sober. And, and, and I was I was going to kill myself. I mean, I listen, nobody can suffer emotionally like like we can. It's it, it's unbelievable the the amount of emotional pain an alcoholic can su can suffer whether they're drinking or not and so so I started to pay a little bit more attention to uh, to to this big book workshop and then I discovered I discovered two people that I ended up becoming friends with later on um, right right around 1994 95 two guys uh, uh, Mark and Joe started going around the country doing these workshops and. Man, when I heard that, it was like, you know, I just, the truth just resonated really deeply with me. And I started listening to these workshops and I, you know, I ended up, I ended up getting to know these guys, and going through the steps with one of them and, uh, and, and really having, having an experience. And that, and that was, I was very, very fortunate, you know, for, for that to happen. And I started to believe that, um, that the solution for alcoholism is in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, being such a fellowship guy, it took a while for me to really come to terms with that because I was, you know, I was a mean, I was a home group member and I start in home groups and doing all this stuff, right? But today I truly believe that um, the causes and the conditions of my alcoholism um, are defined in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And the solution for them is is uh, is laid out in a way I can understand in the book, in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, um, I uh, I got to I'm going to tell you a couple of stories here that have a little bit to do with uh, with my alcoholism. Um, so so when I showed up when I showed up at AA. Um, it took me about four or five months to fall in love with all of you and really, really believe that I'm in the right place. And, and I started to make, I started to make a lot of friends. Uh, and I started to sponsor a lot of people. Now I want to, I want to tell you a little bit about my experience sponsoring. Let me tell you how my sponsor sponsored. Let me tell you how my first two sponsors sponsored. They would say something like, uh, I want to see you at meetings. I want you to be consistent with meetings. Here's my phone number. Uh, I want you to call me, you know, if, if you know, ever feel like drinking or, you know, you're in a jackpot or something and, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'll, we'll, we'll talk, you know, we'll, we'll stay in communication. And that's how they would sponsor. Um, sometimes I would get instructions from them, like go to meeting, go to meeting every night, you know, but, but for the most part, it was almost like a, a big brother kind of a thing, you know, where, where, uh, you know, so just kind of keep an eye on. You. Now um, I get exposed to these steps and I start, I start working them because of, you know, the, the, the nervous breakdown I had kind of pushed me into paying attention to the, to the steps. And I actually, I actually started to, to do the steps, you know, on my own, listening to some of these workshops with the big book open and uh, and I found that that I started uh, I started to heal. Um, my spirit started to heal. So so when I showed up, when I showed up to all of you, um, I was broken. My spirit was broken. Listen, whether I liked it or not, whether I meant it or not, whether I had any power over it or not, I let everybody down. I broke all my promises. Uh, my, all my relationships would end badly. Uh, all my jobs would end badly. Uh, you know, the quality of my life was constantly getting worse. It was not getting better. And, and if, you, you know, if you experience that for decades, 
what will happen is your your self esteem will be crushed. Your uh, your sense of self worth, you, you know, uh, where you think you fit into the world, uh, what type of a person you think you are. It all it's all affected, and 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 it's it crushes it crushes our spirit. And and when I started to work the steps, when I started to work the steps, what happened was slowly because i slowly worked the steps my spirit started to heal and uh and i became less and less connected to the pain of the past and the anxiety of the future it it happened very slowly i you know i wish uh i wish recovery was like flipping a switch but but it took me a long long time for any uh you know any real forward momentum and and I was sponsoring people in, in the first years. And, and I was sponsoring people the way I was sponsored. I would uh, I would give you my phone number, uh, you know, tell you these are the meetings I go to. I'd really like to see at least one or two of those a week. And, uh, you know, call me if you need me. And for one reason or another, I was getting some of the tougher cases in our area. You know, some of the, some are sicker than others. And I was getting some of the sicker ones. And a lot of these guys were drinking on me, making me look bad. You ever have like a sponsee drink on you and make you look bad? You know, it's disconcerting. So, so I had, I had gone through the steps using, you know, the, the Joe and Charlie and then the Joe and Mark tapes. So I started to do something really, really different. I started to bring people over my house and I started to crack the book Alcoholics Anonymous and we would go through it much like some of these uh, big book workshops, but where there was an instruction, uh, we would stop and, and uh, sometimes I'd even do the instruction along with the person I was sponsoring. Now, what happened with that, because I think it's very, very significant for me to, to share what happened with that was the people who actually got through the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and got through the steps, you know, made their amends, uh, you know, did their fist step, uh, put a prayer and meditation discipline together, started to work with other people. Um, this was the early 90s. I still know where every one of them is. And, you know, every one of them is is sober today and uh, and helping other people, the people who got through the steps. Now, there was tons of people who who didn't, who started to work with me and uh, and balked, you know, and and kind of decided that maybe having Chris sponsor him was an overreaction, you know, and they, they, you know, Billy over here just wants me to be the cookie guy. I'm going with the cookie guy. Chris wants me to do all this homework. You know, there were a lot of people like that who, who slid away before they completed, you know, the step work. And, and I don't know where any of them are. <laughs> so, so I'm not saying they, they're dead or they got drunk. I, I just don't, see them around anymore. I don't know where they are. But the people who went through the steps, they're connected. We're, we're connected. We're connected together. Uh, and, and we're going to pay attention to each other's lives. It's just it's part of that, part of that, part of that process. Now, over the course of time, a little bit about, uh, you know, my, my work life. Um, when I got sober, I was, I was a really bad electrician. Uh, I was a kind of electrician where I just wanted my paycheck. I didn't want to know anything about codes or, you know, proper wiring techniques or whatever. I'm just going to wing it, <laughs> you know, and I was blowing a lot of stuff up. It was a mess. So, so I went from like that guy uh, to you, you all um, inspired me. Uh, the step work changed me. I started to do things like go early, stay late, ask if there's anything else I can do. I started to give people a dime for their nickel. It, it just it was part of the, the spiritual expression of my life. It came kind of organically. And I started to tell the truth. And, and I started to do one thing that was really important. I would tell you what I was going to do. And then I was did, then I did what I told you I was going to do. Now, if you work in construction, that's like finding a unicorn, finding somebody like that. Yeah, you know what I mean? So so I started, I started to get promoted a lot. And I went from a bad electrician to running uh, pharmaceutical research and development and manufacturing sites. 
I, I have no idea. Yeah, and I, I wasn't trying to improve my career. It's just it was it was like an organic flow of the next the next thing on my plate. Now, when COVID hit, I retired. Right. Um, I uh, I retired, and you know, I got I got to be honest with you. There's uh, there's I'm very very busy with recovery recovery stuff. I'm all over the planet doing this that or the other thing. You, you gotta you gotta understand. I really do put a lot of work into this stuff. But there's something that I like to do more than anything else in the world. And you want to know what that is? Nothing. I love doing. Yeah, you ever do like nothing? You ever like just sit on the couch and stare into space for like a half an hour? I love it. And. Uh, and this one day I was sitting there doing nothing. And, and my, my wife walks in and she goes, what are you doing? I go, nothing. And she goes, nothing. You know, there's 65 things you can be doing right now. So, so, you know, I started to get the idea that, you know, I'm able-bodied. Okay. Yeah. I'm a retirement age. Right. But I got, you know, I got some horsepower left and, uh, and I'm able-bodied. So, so what I think, what I think I'm going to do is I think I'm going to, I'm going to look around for a job and, uh, and right down the street, I found this facility management job. And compared to what I used to do, it's like a pokey little puppy job. You know what I mean? But it's perfect for retirement. So what it was, was it's uh, I'm a facility manager for a hospice organization. And I got to tell you, I, I friggin' love this job. I love the people that I work for. I love what we do. There's something incredibly spiritual about the people that provide service at this place. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I feel incredibly, incredibly comfortable in, in this, uh, in this job. And because this is kind of a retirement job, I didn't care when I went in there, they said, you know, write a blurb about, you know, who you are and what you are, and we'll put it in the newsletter. Right. We'll like send it. We'll send it out in an email blast. So I so I said, I'm in long term recovery. You know, I'm, I'm in recovery from alcoholism. I didn't say I'm like an AA member. I said I'm in long term recovery. Right. And I put that out. I put that out to all the people that I'm working with. Right. Just because I don't I don't care anymore. There was a period of time where I worried that, you know, they would somebody would find out I'm an alcoholic. I'm way past that point now. So so. Uh, so I let everybody know, you know, I was in, in recovery and almost immediately somebody came to me, you know, with, with a problem with their kid. And, you know, we, we, you know, we navigated the person to, to one of the local treatment centers. And now, now this individual is over a year sober and wants to work at the treatment center, right? It was a kind of a real success story, but I want to tell you, I want to tell you about a story that just happened now. Now, each of us has our own experiences with the miracles of AA. I, I guarantee you, if you're on this Zoom, you've seen the, some of the miracles of AA. And we each, we each have different ones. I want to tell you about one uh, of mine in the last month, okay? Now, my office is in, in the inpatient unit you know, of, uh, of this hospice center. And uh, and believe it or not, folks, we show up there, <laughs> okay? You know, sometimes sober, sometimes not. Uh, but we're easy to spot. Uh, liver cancer, lung cancer, esoph esophageal cancer, right? You know, we're, we're not that hard to spot. And uh, and about a month ago, three of us were in. So out of 10 people in this in this inpatient, three of them are alcoholic. And, I, and I'm going around, you know, and I'm, I'm talking to these people because they let me do that. And I tell them, you know, I'm in, I'm in recovery and I try to be helpful. And, uh, and, and, you know, one of them was 40 years sober uh, and just the most grateful hospice person you've ever seen in your life. And another one, another one had relapsed. And this individual relapsed and ended up with really, really severe uh, cirrhosis of the liver. And when, when they showed up to us, it was, it was close to, you know, listen, people go to this place, guess what, you know, to pass into the next room. And, and that's, and that's what this individual, uh, that's what this individual did, came there, 
you know, to be in a nice place where symptoms will be managed, where, where it's, 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 it's time, it's time to go. And I, I remember I went in there and I started talking to him and uh, incredible amounts of shame because of this horrific relapse. It was like a month long relapse that blew out their liver, right? It must've been awful, but, but just the shame coming off of them, right? And the disappointment, the depression. And I went in there and I was probably the first person to tell them that this wasn't their fault. You know, like, like this is not your fault. Alcoholism is an illness. And unless we get the opportunity to understand what it is and the opportunity to apply a recovery program, we're, we're powerless. It's, there's nothing we can do. It's not our fault, you know? And I guarantee I was the first person in their life telling them at that point, it was not their fault. Everybody was telling them it was, it was their fault, right? So I started, I started to develop a little bit of a relationship with this person. And I said, hey, I got a home group down the street. I got a home group down the street. Uh, these, these two, the the two, one of them had died, and the and the two, the two women that were 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 still alive. Uh, you know, I, I said, look, I, I got a home group right down the street. How about if I ask some of the women to come down and uh, and do a meeting here in the hospice? And, and they both said, oh, okay, that'd be all right. So so. I've got a good enough relationship with the people that run the company that, you know, okay, Chris, <laughs> whatever you want, you know? And so, so I broached this at the home group. I go, I need women. <laughs> and they're looking at me. I said, I said, here, here's the deal. I need you women to come down to the hospice and take a meeting to two of the people that are in there. Now understand that doesn't sound very, appetizing you know like why <laughs> you, you know what I mean? but but they liked me enough to do it so 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 five women from my home group came down and did a meeting with these two people now the person with 40 years was just you know it was like a normal meeting for her she it just made her happy the person that was coming off the relapse that went there to pass there was a shift that day. There was a shift and she started to fight. She started to fight. Right. And, uh, and as this was about three weeks ago and the, the women are cut, listen, the women who thought it was going to be kind of a, kind of an ugly, you know, type of a type of an experience all came to me and said, that is the most significant experience I've ever had in Alcoholics Anonymous, bringing a meeting into there. Can we come back? Can we come back? You know, I got her phone number. I'm going to talk to, you know, they were, they were blown away by this commitment. And this woman started to fight and we're paying a lot of attention to what's going on there. And, uh, and last week she was on a Zoom call with the medical team that uh, that were you know the, that know the most about her liver, and she's really been hoping to get on the liver transplant list. You know, since the girls showed up with the first AA meeting, and uh, that's what she was working toward. And uh, and the doctor said this: said uh, we're not going to put you on the liver transplant list. Why? Why? Because you're getting better. We don't understand it, but you're getting better. <laughs> now, now, what are the chances? Do you, do you know what the odds are to go to an inpatient hospice and get better are? <laughs> so so I, I am telling you that it was the women in this home group and the love of God and the power of AA. And I got to see it one more time, one more time in my life. I've got to see just what the hell, what the hell goes on, uh, you know, in, in, our, in, in the power of God. Here's, here's some of the promises. Here's some of the promises that we get um, 
if we work a program of recovery. And these aren't promises that come from attending closed-minded discussion meetings. These, these are promises that come from actually applying the 12 steps. The most satisfactory years of your existence will lie ahead of you. That's one of the promises. Uh, no matter what your present circumstances are, you will live in a new and wonderful world. So, so our circumstances, you know, we can go broke, we can have loved ones die, we can get fired, you know, we, there's all kinds, of, all kinds of stuff, circumstances that can happen in our life. But if we're solidly in recovery, we will be in that new and wonderful world. And that's a, pro, that's a promise. That's a promise from, from Alcoholics Anonymous. One of the promises is you're not going to you're not going to fear the past. You know, you're not going to fear the future. You are not going to fear the hereafter. That's one of the promises. Do you know what that means? That means you are not going to fear your own death. That's what it means. Do you know how valuable something like that is? To not have to not have to suffer over something that's not happening right now. You know what I mean? So so I could go on and on. I, I could spend the rest of the two hours Kevin wants me to speak, you know, going over, going over promises, you know, you, you know, but 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 these are these are to be experienced. You know, um, I think the first thing that happens when we're encouraged by the book Alcoholics Anonymous is we start to read it, we start to study it, we start to learn it. You know, but but what this book is about is this book is about this this book is the treasure map. It's not the treasure. It's it, so so if we apply the things in this book, you know, we get to live in the new and wonderful world. We 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 are the, the most satisfactory years of our existence will lie ahead of us, you know, if we experience if we experience this stuff. Now I've had a I've had a lot. Yeah, you know, I, I told you about an amazing experience. I, I'm never going to be the same after uh, you know after that hospice experience. But I've had some I ha I've had some tough stuff that's happened. Uh, in the past. And I want, I want to, you know, you know I want to, I want to share some of that. Um, there's been a handful of guys I love, like you wouldn't believe these are people who are, are in my, in my crew who have died. Uh, I got a call. I got a call uh, about two years ago from my first sponsor. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm on my third sponsor now. Right. But um, but my first sponsor and I reconnected through Facebook after he was missing for 20 years. You know, he'd move, he inconvenienced me by moving all around. But but I tracked him down on uh, on Facebook and uh, and we, you know, we picked up right where we left off, just our friendship. And, and he called me up uh, this one time and he goes, hey, Chris, I'm celebrating 40 years today. You know, can you. Uh, can you speak for me on my home group? You know, and I did, I did the thing. And then two months later, he called me up and he said, uh, Chris, I drank. I just got out of the, I just got out of the emergency room. Uh, you know, I drank. Now, now I understand what we're up against folks. You, you know, I, I don't go, Oh my God anymore because, because I know what we're up against. We're up against alcoholism. And what had happened is he had a series of operations and he needed to be on painkiller medications because of, you know, all these crazy operations. And, 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 you know, he lost, he lost control of, uh, of the phenomenon of craving. It, it, it can happen to any of us who get put on like massive amounts of, uh, of fentanyl patches and lauded injections and everything right i mean you know you you can lose track and, and that's what happened another guy who i'm like this with you know i i uh it's just so, we met we met about uh about 2002 and we were really really close friends uh ever since and uh 
And one day I got the call. Uh, I got the call. Hey, uh, you know, he had dropped dead. And this individual, listen, he's got big family and all this stuff. Uh, um, you know, it was a heart attack, right? <laughs> you know, but okay. Uh, but uh, uh, they're not at liberty to share the autopsy report, right? So, so what does that tell me? That that tells me that yeah, he had a heart attack, and, uh, and oh my god. The other day, the other day, somebody, somebody I speak with all over the country. I speak with this guy all over the country. I met him 17 years ago. We were we were both uh, giving a talk at a convention up in Nova Scotia, and we became tight like this, like this. We've been connected ever since. Called me up last weekend. Had 19 years. Chris, I drank. Um, he had to cancel like 19 talks at conventions. <laughs> And like 25 spots easy you had to call up. The poor guy. I'm not, I'm not surprised because I know what we're up against. I know what we're up against. Cunning, baffling, powerful. What I can do on a day-to-day -day basis, what I can do is I can improve my odds by living life according to spiritual principles. Uh, the maintenance of my spiritual condition, I can do. But I'm going to say this to you. If you ever see me staggering down the road, drunk out of my mind, don't be surprised. Because we're up against alcoholism. And one day at a time, we can do the work. We can do the work on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. We can stay connected. We can do our job in AA. And one day at a time, we can get a daily reprieve from this thing. And I, you know, I am, uh, I am forever, forever grateful for, uh, for Alcoholics, Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm, I'm grateful for Zoom. Zoom was amazing. Okay. So, the biggest nightmare of Alcoholics Anonymous would be a phone call goes out and every single AA meeting in the world practically is shut down, right? We're shutting them all down. <laughs> the church uh, up here in the Northeast, we're in church basements. That's where, that's where all of our meetings are. Well, the churches aren't, you know, the churches can't have their congregation, so they're not going to have AA. So sorry. Now, now, what a traumatic experience that, that, that can be, okay? But what did we do? We intuitively realized that we must stay connected. We must stay connected or, or, or we'll be out there on our own. And, and we're just not going to survive on our own. So we discovered this thing called Zoom. And oh man, I was on some of the first meetings. I wasn't happy about it, but I was on some of the first meetings and we didn't know how to mute. And we and we didn't know how to, people were upside down and, and bringing the computer into the bathroom with them. I mean, you everything that could possibly go wrong was we, we were getting Zoom bombed by you know uh, people in Lithuania. I mean, it was insane, but we understood that we needed to stay together. Now, what that experience, what that experience did was we we found our meetings. You know, Kevin, this is one of them, right? But we found our meetings where 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 we we found the, the fellowship we craved, and we we're able to do that in two dimensions while this crazy thing called COVID rampaged around the world. Now, I'm not on as many Zoom meetings. There were, there were times where I was on two, three Zoom meetings a day, right? I'm not on that many anymore. I'm back, I'm back, you know, I'm back at the home groups and I'm taking the meetings into the treatment centers. I'm back doing my 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 third three-dimensional job. But I but but what the Zoom did, what it did was it connected me to all of my friends in a way I would, you know, these are people I would see once every two years or so. Hey, you know, and, and and I got to see him every two or three times a week. And let me tell you what it did for 
other areas of the world. The absolute best Alcoholics Anonymous in the United States got, got imported to Europe and Australia and Guam and Bali and, and South Africa and all these places. So, so listen, we've got a little more experience than some of these countries and some of these groups. And they got to hear messages of depth and weight over and over and over again on this Zoom platform. You know, and Zoom's not going anywhere. There's there's gonna be Zoom, there's gonna be Zoom groups. But it ended up being a good thing. It ended up being a great thing that all of our meetings were shut down. It was a good thing, except for the people who said this, I don't really like Zoom, man. You know, I'm on a computer all day long. I'm gonna go home and get on a computer and do my AA. No thanks. Well, well huh. where are they? <laughs> a lot of them, a lot of them are drinking. A lot of them found that they didn't need a, you know, a, a lot of them have struggled back into the on in-person meetings. Hell, a lot of them had parking lot and, and meetings in their own basement, you know, but, uh, uh, but Alcoholics Anonymous is alive and well. And, uh, and Kevin, I know you wanted wanted me to keep talking, but uh, but uh, you know I, I've, I'm running out of nothing to say, so uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna quiet down now. And I'm gonna give the meeting back to you. Thanks.